Now, the session that we have today is, is a crucial topic for, for communists. All those who defend capitalism, they always say, they point towards the Soviet Union and towards China and so on, and they say, obviously, communism doesn't work. Some might say that communism is a nice idea in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. Now, the idea that those people say that want to convince people of is don't, don't even bother thinking about an alternative to capitalism because that will just end up in gulag, tyranny and brutal dictatorship. The director of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, he, he said in 2020 about the rising support of, of communist ideas and socialist ideas uh, in the US and it's risen since then. He said, when one of four Americans want to overthrow capitalism and embrace socialism, then we know that we have failed in educating about the moral and historic shortcomings of these ideologies. Now, we are here to get educated about these ide ideologies, not in the way that he would like, but we're here to educate ourselves on what real communism is and what it's not. And here to introduce the topic is Niklas Albin Svensson, he is the member of the International Secretariat, the leading body of the soon-to-be Revolutionary Communist International. And he will be speaking for 45 plus 45 minutes, one and a half hours, including translation, which will be followed by a break and then discussion, and then he will sum up. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Niklas. We were discussing this morning the uh, Russian Revolution and how the Bolsheviks, in order, to, uh, in order to prepare for the revolution in Russia, had studied the Paris Commune. And obviously the Paris Commune of 1870, right, was the first time the workers ever took power. But then, in 1917, they didn't just take power in Russia, but they held on to it. And so just like the Bolsheviks studied uh, the Paris Commune, we need to study the Russian Revolution to learn how to take power, yes, but also how to hold on to it and the problems associated with the workers taking power because it's not, uh, you can't just clip your fingers, workers take power and all the problems go away. And really the struggles of the Bolsheviks uh, with backwardness, with poverty and so on, with the counter-revolution, it really must be the starting point for our discussion about this topic. Um, because there are two sides to this question. On the one hand, was the Soviet Union really communist? And the other side to the question is why did it fail? And uh, I will try to go through both of these questions in the coming an hour and a half. Now, following the, uh, the, the revolution, the young worker state had to contend with not just the sabotage of their own ruling class, but the invasion of 21 imperialist armies. And but after they won the civil war, the country was in complete ruins. Even in 1914, Russia was already a backward country. But after three years of devastating war, uh, world war, and then another three years of civil war, the, the economy was in complete shatter completely shattered. And um, Trotsky really, in, in his book, Revolution Betrayed, which is the key book for all comrades to study, the, one of the first points that Trotsky makes is just that because you take power doesn't mean that you can straight away move in immediately to a classless society. And why is that? Because, and this is a quote, the material and cultural inheritance from the past is wholly inadequate for that. Uh, and I'll, talk, I'll come back to the question of the material, but it's worth noting that he puts emphasis on the cultural aspect here. And both Lenin and Trotsky, they placed great importance on the raising of the cultural level of the masses in Russia after the revolution. It's very unfashionable to talk about things like that, because uh, to the postmodernists, all culture is all the same. Whether you are illiterate with no education is the same as if you're literate with a high degree of education and... Uh, high knowledge of art and literature and so on. But Lenin and Trotsky never had that approach. 
And they always understood that for a ruling class to really rule, govern, i.e. the working class to govern society, they needed to acquire a, uh, the highest cultural level and not just the working class, but also their allies uh, in the peasantry. Um, but the, to return to the material question, so the nationalization of the commanding heights of the economy, that is the taking over of the railways, the big banks and the big industries, it didn't immediately uh, abolish what Marx referred to as the struggle for individual existence. And it wasn't true for Russia at that time, nor will it be true for when the revolution, when we take power in uh, our present time either. Although for us, the problem would be much, much smaller than it was for them. Trotsky says that in order to raise productivity, it will be necessary also under socialism to raise wage labor, to retain wage labor and inequality. And he quotes Marx, who refers to this as the lower stage of communism. And for Marx, he approached this in a very abstract manner. Because other than the very short-lived experience of the Paris Commune, he had no worker state to look at and see what it would mean in practice. But what uh, Marx says was that law can never be higher than the economic structure and the cultural developed conditioned by that structure. Basically, you cannot introduce a communist law in a situation where you have the feudal means of production. You cannot have a society of plenty just because you write it in a law saying now we have uh, how free housing, free food, free this, that and the other for everyone. Just because you write that in law doesn't mean it will happen. And to this Lenin added, he said, it follows that under communism there remains for a time not only bourgeois law, law but even the bourgeois state, but without the bourgeoisie. So and this, he was referring to Russia after the seizure of power. And he, he talked about it as a bourgeois state without the bourgeoisie. And he also used another expression, which was a bourgeois worker state, I think. Um, but when the workers took power in the Soviet Union, it wasn't, as Marx had imagined, in one of the most advanced capitalist countries, but in one of the most backward countries on the... So it wasn't, the task wasn't so much to raise the productive forces to the level needed for communism, but the task was to raise them to the level of capitalism. They barely, the forces, productive forces at Russia at the time, barely co corresponded to the level of ca capitalism, never mind socialism. Therefore, Trotsky concluded, it would be more accurate to describe the Soviet Union not as a socialist regime, but as a regime in transition from capitalism to socialism. And what does that mean in practice? It meant that from the very beginning, the state had to defend wage inequality and not just small inequalities. In, at one point, even under the days of Lenin and Trotsky, they had to agree that specialists should be paid six times as much as a skilled worker. Incidentally, I don't know if it's still the case, but uh, trade, the head of the trade union confederation in Sweden, her, her his, is it his or her? Uh -uh. Now, he is now, yeah. His wage is fixed at exactly six times that of a, the average worker he represents. <laughs> there is a parallel between the, bu the bureaucracy of the trade unions and that of a worker state. Um, and uh, the skilled workers were paid more than the unskilled workers, and the unskilled workers were made, paid or got uh, more, you know, more goods and so on than the peasantry. So there was a big, there was quite large inequalities even in the beginning of the Soviet Union. But we are materialists, and we understand that inequality is a necessity in order to develop science and technology. In fact, a histor as a historic, historically, it is necessary. It is the only justification for class society. That is, that some are liberated from the drudgery of manual labor. And uh, class society developed the productive forces and laid the basis for a return at a higher level of classless society, of classless society. And that's what we call communism, or the higher stage of communism. The abolition, superabundance, uh, plenty for everyone, a society without a need for classes anymore. But this can only happen precisely in a society where everyone's needs are catered for. And Russia, after the uh, end of the Civil War, was precisely the opposite. It was a backward country ravaged by war, famine, disruption of production, transport, 
And consequently, they had to maintain inequality in order to ensure that some people were able to function as specialists, engineers, even generals, and so on. And they defend, the state defended this unequal, unequal distribution of resources between different layers in society. And here is a contradiction. The state had a dual character. On the one hand, it was defending socialist property relations, that is, the productive forces were in everyone's hands. Uh, on the other hand, it was defending capitalist norms of distribution, that is, inequality. And uh, here's a quote, which is a little bit hard, but I think it says a lot. The social demand for a bureaucracy arises in all those situations where sharp antagonism required to be softened, adjusted, regulated. Always in the interests of the privileged, the possessors, and always to the advantage of the bureaucracy itself. And this is the problem, basically, that the revolution faced after the taking of power. The bureaucracy was an outgrowth of the primitive conditions that existed in Russia at the time. As the productive forces developed, this would mean that gradually the state would be less and less having to defend the capitalist norms of distribution. And gradually, it would start to wither away. Um, Trotsky also says, I think this is from Trotsky, I forgot to write down where it was from. The poorer the society that issues from a revolution, the sterner and more naked would the expression of this law, the more crude would be the forms assumed by bureaucratism and the more dangerous would it become for socialist development. So this bourgeois law that Lenin talked about, Lenin explains how this was much more of a problem in Russia than it would have been if the workers had taken part in power in Germany or France at the time. And far from withering away, the, the, uh, the bureaucracy actually started dominating the state and dominating the masses. Um, this Stalin actually started talking about this question in one of his speeches in the 20s. And he said that it was a relic of the past that meant that you had to maintain the state. And that was the problem. That's what uh, was the cause of a bureaucracy. But Trotsky says this is not the case. This is not the important question. He said it is prevented by immeasurably mightier factors such as material want, cultural backwardness, and the resulting dominance of bourgeois law in what most immediately and sharply touches every human being. The business of ensuring everyone's personal existence. So the struggle for every uh, for the individual existence was still a, a massive factor in the Soviet Union. And Trotsky tried to define what the Soviet Union was. And this was not an easy matter. I said he said it was a regime in transition, but he, uh, he didn't think this was sufficient. He basically said there's not a one line you, you can say to define what the Soviet Union was. He says, there's nothing more dangerous than to throw out reality for the sake of logical completeness. Basically, he was directing himself against those who were saying, oh no, the Soviet Union is socialist, or the Soviet Union is capitalist, or whatever. Just can't define it that simply. He said it's a regime in transition towards either socialism or capitalism. The productive forces are not sufficiently advanced. There's a tendency towards primitive accumulation. What he means by that is the bureaucracy enriching themselves and starting to accumulate personal wealth. The norms of distribution remain bourgeois. Economic growth is not reducing this, but increasing the question of inequality. It's the more the economy is growing, the more inequality is growing. There's an uncontrolled caste of bureaucrats that are alien to socialism. S the social revolution remains in property relations and the consciousness of the masses. Further development can lead either to socialism, sorry, either to capitalism or to socialism. And a counter-revolution would need to overcome the resistance of the workers in order to restore capitalism. And in order to put the, the, the Soviet Union back onto a road towards socialism, the workers would need to overthrow the bureaucracy. Uh, the outcome of this struggle of living forces, the outcome will be determined by the struggle of living forces, including uh, internationally. Uh, that's the def uh, definition that Trotsky left us with. Quite a long one. 
And really, he wrote the whole book on the question, so he wasn't even satisfied simply with those lines. <laughs> but this is the, it goes to the core of the need to understand the process that is unfolding in a dialectical manner of competing forces fighting against each other, the class struggle also inside the socialist regime. I want to give you an idea of what then took place in the history of the Soviet Union, but I have very little time, so I'm going to have to really rush for it. And I didn't even have time to go into the really uh, juicy parts about uh, Yeltsin, which comes at the end. But maybe I'll have some time in my summing up, I can go into it. So, th so the first two decades, was first two decades after 1921 had a very impressive economic growth. And the economic, economy didn't just recover to pre-war levels, but actually developed beyond that, particularly in heavy industry. The annual growth rate in the 1930s was an average of 6%, with uh, double-digit growth in industry. And this was at the same time as Europe was in the middle of a, the Great Repression, repression the Great Depression. <laughs> So whilst Europe was stagnating, uh, there was a massive upswing uh, of the economy in the Soviet Union. And this showed the potential of the planned economy, but it also coincided with the political counter-revolution and the defeat of uh, the opposition to the bureaucracy, particularly uh, the left opposition. And Stalin purged the Bolshevik party of all revolutionary forces, and the party became the party of the state bureaucracy, not of the working class. And the ranks of the party was being filled by careerists, by old Mensheviks, by uh, old Tsarist officials, and so on. And uh, towards the end of the 30s, he started not just from, uh, by purging them from the party, but also to physically exterminate them, including family members, friends, anyone who had, had any contact with the left opposition. There was a campaign to exterminate the memory of October, basically. And in this campaign, they killed a million or so people. And this was, the necess uh, was necessary in order to stabilize the regime. Um, yes. Party membership now conferred all kinds of uh, benefits. Any kind of career that you wanted in industry or in the state, anywhere you wanted a career, you needed to be a Communist Party member in order to get advancement. And you also got your special privileges, party shops, uh, special goods and so on, they're all available to party members. So the party of uh, uh, the Bolshevik party of 1938, 1939 had absolutely nothing to do with the party of Lenin. And that's important to consider when we then see how things were developed. And, and the Second World War, uh, as you know, started from the point of view of the Soviet Union in 1941. And it was the second serious attempt by imperialism to destroy the, the, the Soviet Union and restore capitalism. It is an open secret that the aim of uh, Roosevelt and Churchill was to bleed the Soviet Union as much as possible, to weaken it so that they could then move in and restore capitalism. And uh, the, the war started by Stalin bungling the defense of the Soviet Union completely and his cronies. In an effort to try to uh, appease Hitler, they had even destroyed the fortifications on the eastern, western front. This, is, this was part of the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. They also handed over thousands of uh, German communists who had taken shelter in Russia and they handed them over to Hitler. So both uh, materially and politically, they disarmed themselves before this onslaught that came. But the revolution still remained in the minds of the masses who rose to its defense. And the, the coming three years was another uh, example of the massive heroic sacrifice of the masses of uh, the Soviet Union yeah, against uh, fascism. They basically were just throwing themselves in front of the tanks and machine guns in order to halt the advance or slow down the advance of uh, the Wehrmacht. Eventually the bureaucracy got its act together and started pre uh, preparing uh, for the war. They moved whole swathes of industry from the west in beyond the Ural Mountains to keep it away from Hitler's bombers. And they, and they started producing at a level that was um, you know, was uh, impossible to match by the Germans. But it came at a tremendously high cost uh, on the part of the masses of the Soviet Union. Out of uh, 70 to 100 million dead in World War II, 20 million uh, were Soviet Union, citizens of the Soviet Union. And uh, for all, you know, for all the British talk about, the, you know, the <laughs> bombing of London and so on. Most of the rest of the victims were in East Asia, in the battle with Japan, between Japan, China, and so on. 
The defeat of Hitler strengthened the bureaucracy for a whole period. As you know, the, uh, the, the Red Army conquered the whole of Eastern Europe. He could probably have conquered the whole of Germany as well, but uh, Stalin held back in order for the Allies to meet him in Berlin. He was trying to keep the Allies sweet. It didn't work. They immediately set about trying to undermine the Soviet Union after the war. But in the process, uh, the, there was a number of friendly regimes that were set up in Eastern Europe that were friendly to the Soviet Union. And in spite of uh, some of the nonsense of the bureaucracy, like the policy of self-reliance, Basically, they had the idea that every country had to have a self-independent, uh, self-reliant industry. So, so rather than building up a strong car industry in the Soviet Union, a strong uh, television industry in Poland or whatever, and then trading with each other for everyone's benefit. Each regime developed their own uh, TV uh, brand, their own car brand, their own motorcycle brand and so on. Economically, complete madness, but it made sense from the point of view of the narrow interest of the bu uh, bureaucracy. But this gave, anyway, the impetus for another wave of economic development in the Soviet Union. And they quite qu quickly recovered from the devastation of the war. Uh, but as the economy developed the problem with economic mismanagement, they grew. The way that the uh, uh, economy was structured, it was necessary for the state centrally to control all the decisions in the economy. And you have the infamous GOS plan, the headquarters where all of this was attempting to, they were attempting to do this. A mass, massive centralized bureaucracy in Moscow, which was trying to decide what every single factory was producing and how much of everything and how they were going to get their resources and so on. And this works okay when you have a relatively simple economy, but the more complex the economy becomes, as you, I'm sure you can work out yourself, the more difficult it becomes to control every single aspect of it. So they became more, they just developed more and more government departments to trying to cope with the demand for increase from the, of the increased complexity of the economy. In the 1950s, the economy developed well, about 6% annually. In the 1960s, it also was maintained. They even loosened repression a bit under the, the repression of political opinions and so on. They loosened that a bit in order because things were going well, so they felt more secure. And to many workers, you must have seen like things were getting better. Not at all unlike what was happening in West, in Europe, at the same time. Um, but uh, things took a uh, turn for the worst in the 1970s. Growth rates fell to 4%, and to 3%, and to 2%. And these were the official figures. And if you know anything about the bureaucracy, and that this is independent of which kind of bureaucracy it is, there's always a tendency for those at the bottom to try to lie to their superiors in order to uh, get them off their back. So the more, the, the worse the economy went, uh, start, develop, developed, the more the uh, all levels of the bureaucracy started lying about what was going on. Trotsky said that the planned economy needs um, democracy the way that a, the body needs oxygen. And this is basically what he was referring to. You need that democracy, you need that control by the workers, by the people who have an interest in keeping the economy going. They need to be in control in order to ensure that this doesn't happen. But the bureaucracy doesn't function like that. They're just interested in making sure that keep their bosses happy. So if their superiors demanded a ton of nails, well, then they delivered one ton of nails, fulfilling the quota which they had been given, but for them, it didn't matter whether these nails were any good to a carpenter or not. If they were crooked, they were a bit too big, too small, it didn't matter because they produced a ton of nails, right? Yeah. And the more demands the bureaucracy centrally were making, the more the cheating and the lying got. The famous problem was that uh, they started producing only one left foot shoes in one year. Because the quote that was set in numbers of shoes and not numbers of pairs of shoes. And obviously, if you only produce left shoes, it's much easier to fulfill the quote than if you produce both left and right shoes. So you'd go to the shop one year and you buy the left shoe and then you come back the next year to buy the right shoe. And Trotsky comments on, comments on this. He says, under a nationalized economy, quality demands a democracy of producers and consumers, freedom of criticism and initiatives. And these are conditions which are incompatible with a totalitarian regime of fear, lies, and flattery. And we could see during the pandemic how a modern economy, there's a, this very it's delicate balance between the different sectors of the economy. 
If there's a problem in one branch, it's very easy to translate this into many other sectors of the economy. And the bureaucracy always man uh, struggled to maintain that balance. And the more the revolution receded into me memory, the, when the greater the complexity of the co economy became, the worse the situation also became. Um, and Brezhnev, in uh, 1977, I think it was, yeah, Brezhnev was, uh, it took over after Khrushchev, I think. Yeah. And he, he was one of the more longer serving uh, leaders of the Soviet Union. But as the economy was getting worse and worse, he had to attempt to put a nice sheen on it, like put a nice face on it. And he, uh, he held a speech. He was known for giving really bad speeches. But he, he came up with a new concept that they now, uh, had now achieved developed socialism as to the pre previous undeveloped socialism. The idea being, of course, that you were, they were still on the road to communism. They were taking it step by step, slowly, but they were getting there. But this didn't really stick in the minds of the masses, either in the Soviet Union or outside. Something about the Soviet Union clearly wasn't the way that the workers, when they were fighting for socialism or communism, this is not what they had imagined. The object of socialism was freedom, dignity, not a world of luxury necessarily, but one where a world where everyone's needs were met, a world without classes, without gaping inequality, a world of culture, happiness, joy, and the world without a state that was uh, bearing down on society, smothering uh, creativity, initiative, and so on. And at this time, the living conditions in West had significantly improved for workers. And so people were saying, well, something must be wrong here. And from this, the Stalinists came up with a new concept, the concept of actually existing socialism, or really existing socialism, which basically is a mirror image of bourgeois propaganda. In the bourgeois, they say, well, socialism and communism is a nice idea in theory, but in practice, it doesn't really work. And rather than countering it and say, look, this is not socialism, this is not communism, this is something else. The Stalinists said, well, look, uh, you know, there is the nice idea of socialism, and then there's the really existing socialism, which is not so nice. <laughs> I think they don't really, didn't really think of it in that, those terms. But if you really boil down to it, this is essentially what they were saying. And it is a massive insult to socialism and communism to equate it with what, what was going on in the Soviet Union. And they actually contributed to the massive demoralization after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because all the time they've been saying, well, this is socialism, right? This is the best it's going to get. So obviously when that collapsed and all the dirty secrets were revealed, well, it was... They have basically fed, uh, prepared the ground for precisely the uh, uh, capitalist, uh, the propaganda campaign of the capitalists that came after in the 1990s. And I will skip this part, to make, might come back to it later. Now, the only way to resolve the problem of bureaucracy would have been with workers' control. Workers would have no interest in fulfilling quotas just for the sake of it. If there was freedom of discussion, then you, if you couldn't fulfill the quota, you would just say, we can't fulfill the quota. And the plan, the national plan, would be readjusted accordingly in order to ensure that uh, everything else worked accordingly. But in a bureaucratically planned economy, no one wants to hear any objections. No one wants to go to their superiors and say that the target was impossible to fulfill. And the quality of the production got worse and worse and worse, and particularly in consumer goods. Um, I can't remember where the statistic is from, maybe the seven, late 70s or early 80s. But something like 50% of the clothes that reached the stores were, had to be discarded because they were such poor quality. But it also affected uh, more serious, well, more serious, but the more central parts of the economy, like oil production. In 1983, 20% of the oil wells were out of action because of lack of repair, mismanagement, or lack of labor. But of course, the top bureaucracy weren't affected by these shortages and short equality. They had their own shops. With, their own, with goods that were not available to normal workers, uh, including imported goods from the West. The inequality in this period raised, reached hair-raising hair levels, and it wasn't just the official income, but also a lot of embezzlement. Millions of dollars of worth of goods were uh, siphoned away from the official uh, channels to be exported to the West and sold, and the, the profits pocketed by the bureauc bureaucrats or they sold uh, them on the mar black market in the Soviet Union. 
Um, Ted Grant, in the other book, which is on the table here, he comments that the ruling elite fell more and more under the influence of capitalism and the more alienated they became from Soviet society. And these bureaucrats were now living off the backs of the workers in a way that really resembled the way the capitalists live in the backs of the workers in the West. They had villas, they had luxury cars, mink coats, jewelry, expensive watches. But they didn't acquire this wealth from private ownership, but through looting the state's coffers, basically. And uh, there was a lot of cynical jokes that proliferated in this time. Here's one that I found on the internet. No, I actually heard it before, but I, I couldn't remember the words. It, just to give you a, f a feeling of how people were thinking about it when they, um, when they were, uh, how ordinary people were thinking about what's going on. A regional communist party, so this is the joke then. So a regional communist party meeting is held to celebrate the anniversary of the great socialist, great October socialist revolution. And the chairman obviously has to give a speech. He says, dear comrades, let's look at the amazing achievements of our party after the revolution. For example, Maria here, who was she before the revolution? An illiterate peasant. She had, had but one dress and no shoes. And now? She is an exemplary milkmaid, known throughout the entire region. Or look at Ivan Andreev. He was the poorest man in the village. He had no horse, no cow, and not even an axe. And now, he is a tractor driver with two pairs of shoes. Or... Trofim Semanovich Alexeyev. He was a nasty hooligan, a drunk, and a dirty gadabout. I know what they were Nobody would trust him with as much as a snowdrift in wintertime. As he would steal anything he could get his hands on. And now? Now he's the secretary of the regional committee of the party. <laughs> So this is the way that people felt about this. And this is also why the bureaucracy had to stifle all kinds of democratic discussion. Because the moment they lifted the lid on discussion, the privileges and the corruption and the lying and the cheating of the bureaucracy would be the first thing that comes up. The capitalists, to give them their due, I mean, it's not often you give them their due, but, you know, to give them their due, they actually, when they got their profit, at least some of it would be put back into the production, investment in production. But the bureaucracy, they didn't put their profits uh, in back into production. Every penny they got, they, all they could spend it on was luxury consumption. And so they got, became like the worst uh, capitalists in the West. And they, be, they were completely parasitic on the economy. And it was getting worse. The more of a fetter they became on the further development of the economy, the more the corrupt and uh, rotten they became. And the children were the worst. If their fathers and grandfather, grandfathers were corrupt gangsters, but at least they had some kind of memory or connection to the revolution in 1917. But their children, they were born parasites. Like the sons and daughters of the bourgeoisie, these new members were completely acclimatized to their role as parasites. <coughs> living a lavish life, completely divorced from that of the working class. When the Soviet Union and the uh, other deformed worker states in Eastern Europe collapsed, several of the leaders announced that they hadn't believed in socialism for a long time. And it's hardly surprising. Um, then we get to starting to come to the end. And Gorbachev is the beginning of the end. And Gorbachev, he became a leader by accident because all the other leaders uh, died. They were too old. 
There are lots of jokes about that as well. That's a website and Wikipedia, uh, there's a page on Wikipedia just with these kind of jokes. Um, but he reflected a layer of the bureaucracy that were attempting to reform the system. He talked about workers' control, he talked about democracy, talked about openness. In fact, glasnost, which is one of the uh, words associated with him, his campaign of glasnost, that means openness. But none of this could be implemented as long as the bureaucracy had a stranglehold on society. In fact, if the bureaucracy had a choice between uh, workers' control or capitalism, it's fairly obvious which choice, they, which road they would choose. They were already living like capitalists, effectively. The only thing they couldn't do was to pass on this wealth and property or this uh, income to their children. They couldn't pass it on in inheritance. Because the income was dependent on their position in the state, not by its private ownership. But in the early stages, this choice, it wasn't clear to them that they were having to make a choice between um, socialism or capitalism. And uh, Ted comments, he says, this was the fundamental flaw in Gorbachev's position. To encourage greater initiative and therefore greater productivity from the workers, while simultaneously defending the privileges and perks of the bureaucracy, was to attempt to square the circle. Gorbachev was attempting to lean on the working class in order to strike blows against an, uh, one section of the bureaucratic caste. But, but he was doing that in order not to overthrow the bureaucracy as a whole, but to stabilize the system and preserve the bureaucracy. This wasn't the first time this was uh, attempted, but this time it was under different conditions than the previous times. The bureaucracy had gone, gone from being a relative factor on production to an absolute factor. That is, um, before, if, if, before, if there was workers' control, the economy would have developed faster and on a more sustainable basis. But even under the bureaucracy, there was some development. Thereby, it was a relative factor. But now it was an absolute factor in the sense that there was no development taking place at all. Um, and, the, uh, and the economy was uh, stagnating and the collapse was just around the corner. 200,000 of the most corrupt officials were sacked as part of uh, Gorbachev's campaign. But this, is a, but this bureaucracy was 19 million at this time. And at the same time, for the workers, the pressure only increased. Perestroika, which was the other uh, slogan, became hated by the workers. For them, it meant uh, worsening of living standards, combined with more pressure at work, to work harder, work longer hours, and so on. At the same time, the bureaucracy was enriching themselves more and more and more. Alcoholism became a serious problem in society to the point where you noticed it in statistics with the absences and so on from work. They attempted to clamp down on alcohol use, but it just didn't have any impact at all. All it did was lead to riots, resistance and uh, attempts to circumvent the prohibitions. There was a Brief moment of a growth in, uh, in the 80s, but things quickly turned to the worse. Food was left rotting in the fields. Theft and embezzlement got worse. The black market became the main source of goods and food for the consumers. Shelves, shelves were empty and by 1990, 70 million people were living on the breadline. A wave of strikes gripped the Soviet Union, culminating in the minor strike of 300,000 workers. A poll was published in November 1990, concluding that only 15 to 20 percent believed in socialism. And the disillusionment and skepticism among uh, ordinary people were reflected in jokes. And this one is from Ted's book. 
And uh, the question is, have we reached real communism yet? Or is it worse still to come? This was the attitude. You can see the cynicism of the joke, right? Riots became uh, common and the masses were losing their, fa uh, their uh, fear of the repressive apparatus of the state. They would attack the police, they would drive them back. But still, in, in spite of all this, in 1990, more than 40% favor a return to more centralized economic management. And only 25% favored a more market-oriented system. Um, so the move to capitalism was not popular at all. But bureaucracy seriously started to move towards capitalism. They had lost all confidence in socialism. That means that they've lost all confidence in themselves. And they were looking with awe and admiration at the West. And this is uh, the point where uh, the bureaucracy or a wing of the bureaucracy becomes conscious of their attempt to re restore capitalism. Gorbachev attempted to resist the uh, calls for rapid movement to capitalism. But the situation was moving out of his control. A program of austerity was begun, including privatization, starting with small business as always. Prices were deregulated and so were wages. And this began a, a rapid snowball uh, of the return to capitalism. So what was my hmm. question is, do we have enough time for this? Yeltsin. It's the end of the story, but it's a, it's a really nice part of the story. When I say it's a nice part, it's because it's, it's a period that's been so much lied about uh, in history. Yeltsin in uh, the West was this great hero. We saved democracy, you know? He introduced democracy to Russia. Uh, away with corruption, away with communism, for democracy. Well, he certainly got rid of the planned economy, but none of the rest is true. He, was, he became the representative of the wing of the bureaucracy that were consciously pushing in the direction of capitalism and wanted to do this as quickly as possible. So whilst Gorbachev was vacillating, doing one thing, then going back on himself, Yeltsin was demanding to move ahead. And uh, it started with the, uh, the he became leader of uh, Russia, the Russian Socialist Federation, as opposed to the Soviet Union, which was led by Gorbachev. But by pushing on the national question, Yeltsin pushed to the integration of disintegration of the whole of the Soviet Union, thus pushing himself to the front and making Gorbachev become a non-entity. In order to stop the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the hardliners launched a coup. The wing of the bureaucracy was trying to resist the rapid move to capitalism. They put Gorbachev under house arrest. But here, Gorbachev refused to resign. Yeltsin uh, bar barricaded himself in the White House in Moscow. And he appealed for the masses to come out. He appealed for a general strike. There was no general strike. But 10,000 turned up to surround the White House. Mainly of the petty bourgeois types. Um, the coup makers attempted to assault the White House. But they didn't have any confidence in himself, and after only a few dead, they pulled back and the whole thing unraveled. Ted Common says the most useless coup ever, re re which reflected a lack of confidence that this wing of bureaucracy had in what they were uh, offering. Gorbachev was now a spent force. There was he, he, his attempt was to be, be was to balance between. He was trying to balance between the pro-capitalists and the sort of hardliners, he was balancing between those two factions. But as soon as the hardliners were smashed, obviously there was, he, he didn't have anyone to balance on anymore. And Yeltsin took a step, but became the new leader. By the end of the year, the Soviet Union had been dissolved. This is not the end of the story. There's another 
seven or so years it took for capitalism to stabilize in Russia. In the meantime, the econ economy went into free fall. In 1989, the, uh, the economy was worth $1.46 trillion. By 1998, it was worth $800 billion. So it was a fall of 44%. And uh, it was basically an unmitigated disaster. And in response to the economic problems, the West was demanding more shock, more therapy. <laughs> This was the consequence of what the West, the, what they called the shock therapy. El Yeltsin uh, proceeded along the lines of what the West was asking him to do. He became more or less open agent of the West. He uh, used the privatization as a means of bribing officials to rig ballots. Basically, if you, uh, if you rig the ballots in this region, I'll hand you over the state-owned enterprises of, of, of this and that company, you can take that over. <laughs> and so this, uh, many of these so-called democratic uh, elections and referendums that Yeltsin won was on the basis of this kind of corrupt, uh, corruption, basically, through and through. He also uh, had his own military coup when he uh, assaulted parliament with tanks. But this is another episode where you can see that there was not a lot of enthusiasm for this new regime. Basically, parliament had barricaded himself in the White House again. And Yeltsin, having a bit more gumption than the, uh, his uh, predecessors in coup making, he realized that he needed to uh, assault parliament with tanks and soldiers in order to dissolve it. But in his memoirs, he complains had a, he had at his disposal and he had at his disposal an army of two and a half million soldiers but he couldn't find a single regiment in order to carry out this task in the hell and with the help of a loan from the west he organized a mercenary army consisting of GPU officers, police officers, and other scum of society. And with this ragtag bunch, he then went through and assaulted parliament. After that coup, he also banned the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, seized all their assets, and so on. Um, but, the, but his economic policies were a complete disaster, as I said. And uh, this had an impact and the workers actually the, the started to uh, got very uh, angry. And so by the mid-90s, you're starting having a widespread resistance among workers. At this point, you have a poll that said that 48% of the uh, population felt that so uh, preferred socialism to capitalism with only 27% 27 uh, 27 thinking that capitalism would be better than socialism if you remove the undecided that means two thirds were in favor of socialism whatever that means and one third for capitalism in 1997-98, round about that time, opinion polls showed that Yeltsin's support was at 3%. It makes modern bourgeois politicians look fairly popular. And at this point in 96-98, that period, you could have had a reversal of the process. 
But only if there was a leadership that could take uh, the reins and fight and um, lead the workers to take power. The hardliners, more or less, had reconstituted themselves as the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. They had no experience of mass work, being state bureaucrats all their lives. And they were also reformists. In spite of the name, they openly defended capitalism. And their attempt in this period was not so much to restore socialism or the planned economy, but to prove themselves that they could be a trusted partner in a capitalist regime. But uh, they and they became one of the pillars of the Putin regime. Uh, and they he helped stabilize capitalism and prepare the way then for Putin to come in and take over. So, to return to the original question. I'm fairly sure that you knew the answer to that question before you came here. No, no, communism did not fail. <laughs> it's a bit hot here, isn't it? The Soviet Union never achieved communism nor socialism. It remained a backward country compared to the advanced capitalist countries of the West. Um, and in spite of tremendous steps forward, if you compare Russia to 1914, to, in 1914, 1917, say, to 1987, it's a completely different place. But it never caught up to the capitalist West. And the more the productive forces grew, the more they, they rebelled against the stranglehold of the bureaucracy. It's one of those interesting um, aspects of dialectics that it's actually for quite a similar reason that uh, the uh, productive forces rebels against capitalism. Basically that the productive forces have outgrown capitalism as a system. In a very, in very similar way, the productive forces also outgrew the uh, bureaucratically deformed worker state in the Soviet Union. Because in spite of the nationalized uh, property, in, or the socialized property, the planned economy, many of the problems that you face under capitalism, you also faced under the Soviet Union. But the collapse of this regime in the uh, early 90s, or in the 90s, was not a popular movement from the masses whatsoever. It was fragile, tentative, and it was only secured in 1998. And in the process of uh, securing democracy, Yeltsin banned the Communist Party, sent tanks against Parliament, and sold off industries to the highest bidder as bribed to rigged elections. All of it helped and guided by Western imperialism. The working class remained demoralized and leaderless. The so-called hardliners had no perspectives and they had no alternative to rest capitalist restoration. Even so, the workers fought back against capitalist restoration, but the Communist Party betrayed them. So what failed in the Soviet Union was not communism, but Stalinism a bureaucratically degenerated caricature of socialism. Now, we are faced often with the accusation, as Silva mentioned, that we want to resurrect this system today. But the situation is completely different today than it was at that time. 
No doubt we will face many difficulties on the road. But as revolutionaries, we can lean on the experiences of 100 years of class struggle since 1917. We got the experience of the first worker state. And the productive forces um, all over the world have tri developed tremendously. In particular in the backward countries. The former colonial countries, like China or India, which means that the working class in, on a world scale is far stronger than it was back in 1917. And this means that we're in a far better position to not just take power, but also to hold on to it. And with the help of the international that we're building right now, we will spread it from country to country. We'll help by the internet, we will spread it from country to country. Meaning that socialism will not be isolated in one backward country struggling to survive. But we'll, we'll create a world socialist federation Using all the most modern techniques, we'll take them, we'll develop them, we'll perfect them. We will abolish hunger and poverty, bureaucracy and oppression, and we will usher in a new epoch for humanity. And we will prepare the way for a genuine communist society. Thank you. Uh, all right, we're gonna move on to the discussion now. And there's more time uh, in, in the discussion, so if anyone is thinking about intervening, just put your hand up anytime during the discussion and I'll bring, bring you in, at least a few of you. But first off, we have Ben Glinetsky, and he will be followed by Ubaldo. So in, in 1956, in Hungary, there was a, a mass movement, a genuine proletarian revolution. A movement for genuine socialism. And we can compare what the situation was like in Hungary in 1956 with the aspirations of that mass movement to understand the difference between what existed in Hungary and what genuine socialism would have looked like. Not in, not in theoretical terms, but in practical terms, the practical, the real aspirations of the Hungarian workers. So after the Second World War, when the Red Army swept through Eastern Europe, the, the, the first instinct of the, of the Stalinists was to try and maintain capitalism in Hungary. This proved impossible because the Hungarian uh, bourgeois liberals and so on had all fled with the Nazis. And so the Stalinists implemented a planned economy in Hungary. There was no genuine workers' democracy. It was in the model of the Soviet Union. This, this was revolutionary in the sense that there was a complete change in the economic system. It was, it was not a revolution in the sense that we understand it, in the sense that Trotsky describes it, of the masses entering into the, onto the stage of history. It was, it was imposed from the top down. And in that early period of, of Stalinization, there was a, a pillaging of, of the heavy industry from Hungary and it was shipped to the Soviet Union. Whole industries were uprooted and just transferred because it was the heavy industry that was most important for the Soviet Union at that time. And that was, that was part of the reason uh, why, why economic crisis began to develop. By 1955, the Hungarian economy was in crisis. The, the oil fields were, were flooded because there was a, a too rapid rise in the rate of production out of those fields. The, the buildings that were being uh, built, they were built very, short, very far short of the necessary standards for a good building. It was done anyway to hit the targets. It was estimated that about 40% of the goods that were being shipped from the factories were defective. 
but they were shipped anyway because it was necessary to meet the targets. All of these were, were bureaucratic mistakes, the mistakes of a bureaucratically planned economy. And this is what had produced the economic crisis in Hungary at that time. So the, the leadership of, uh, of, of the Hungarian government, it, it zigzagged, it moved from in one direction and then another, from liberal to hard line. With all the, all the different leaders imposed from Moscow, imposed from afar, there was no, no democracy. It was very blatant, very open, obvious uh, control from Moscow. And after the speech by Khrushchev to the 20th Congress uh, of the party, in which he blamed Stalin for all the... He said, look at all these abuses that Stalin has, has done. Look, the, the, all the problems are Stalin's fault, basically. This, this provoked a big questioning uh, in, all, all across the Eastern Europe, the satellite states, the Soviet Union itself. And, and the things that were being questioned were, why, why do we have a bureaucratically planned economy? Why, do, why is this causing crisis? Why are our leaders being imposed upon us from Moscow? And so in October 1956, there were student protests in, in Hungary. But their demands went beyond narrow student demands. They talked about political questions, like the party leadership, the question of freedom of expression. <clears throat> Now, the Stalinists said that this, these protests were an attempt to undermine socialism. They said they were an attempt to undermine the planned economy, in fact. But one of the demands that was being put forward was friendship with the USSR on the basis of genuine equality. Another demand was solidarity with the workers of Poland who were, who were protesting in the same way. These are not the demands of people who want to undermine the planned economy and socialism. And these protests developed into a revolutionary movement. And, and this, is the, this is one of the important points. Because that movement involving workers and young people, it, it moved instinctively in the direction of workers' control and workers' democracy. All over the country, committees of workers were established it's true that they, they rejected the term Soviet. They didn't, they didn't use the word Soviet to describe these committees. Yeah, because that had been tainted by the Stalinists. Instead, they talked about revolutionary committees. And in some cases, they, they also talked about national committees. And this is a point I don't have time to develop. But the, the Stalinist approach to the national question had created a lot of... Uh, it was another uh, source of anger and frustration in Hungary. A, a very, a, a very uh, far cry from the Leninist approach to the national question, which is the genuine communist approach. So if, if you want to understand the difference between Stalinism and genuine communism, then you can look at that, that national question, which found an expression in Hungary also. But yeah, these, these workers' committees were set up. Now, there was a, a British journalist in Hungary at the time. He, he was a journalist for the British Communist Party. He actually ended up expelled from the British Communist Party because he wrote about what he actually saw taking place in Hungary, which was not what the Stalinists wanted to hear. His name's Peter Fryer, and, and he said this about the workers' committees. He said, of course, as with every real revolution from below, there was too much talking, arguing, bickering, excitement and agitation and, and ferment. That's, that's one side of the picture. The other side is the emergence to leading positions of ordinary men and women who the, who the secret police had kept submerged. Sorry. The revolution thrust them forward, aroused their civic pride and their latent genius for organization and set them to work to build democracy out of the ruins of bureaucracy. So this is, a, this is a, a British Stalinist describing what can only be described as a, as a genuine revolutionary movement. He's describing genuine workers' democracy, which up until that point had been absent. And this revolutionary movement is spread to the countryside. The peasants organized to send food to the cities for it to be distributed for free to help the revolution. They dismantled the, the cooperatives which had been forced on them. But which the Stalinists said, well, this shows they're not in favor of cooperative working. They want to reestablish uh, capitalist relations. This is the Stalinist line. But there are resolutions. Resolutions were passed by the peasants at this time, and you can read them. 
saying we will not accept, it says explicitly, we will not accept the return of landlordism and capitalism. So all these committees that were set up, they, they demanded uh, that workers' councils be given control. Control over production, that wages be increased, that wage differentials be capped, uh, a rapid program of house building. In other words, genuine socialism, which was none of that was present at the time in Hungary. This is what they were having to fight for. Now, there were many uh, confused elements in, in the Hungarian Revolution, anarchists and so on. And, and obviously, of course, Western imperialism sent agents in to try to, to connect with this movement. The Catholic Church also tried to intervene in this movement. But none of these had a decisive impact on this movement. They were all there, they were elements of it, but they were not the driving force and they clearly were not behind the demands of, these, of this movement. In fact, you can, you can see the progress, the development of the, of the thinking of the revolutionaries. The first radio broadcasts that, that they made asked the UN to intervene. But the last radio broadcast called for workers of the world to unite. So you can see that this, the point of, uh, of, of, of bringing this question into this discussion is, is to show that we don't need to compare uh, the Soviet Union or Hungary, the Eastern Bloc, we don't need to compare this to an abstract theory of what, what communism or what socialism should look like. You can compare it to the actual demands and aspirations of, of the working class, of workers, of the masses in Hungary. And through that you see that what existed in Hungary was not socialism, it wasn't communism. That, that's what the masses were fighting for, against the Stalinist regime that existed. And this, this journalist, Peter Fryer, he, in, in his book on, on Hungary, he, he wrote this, on the Hungarian Revolution, he wrote this. He said, Stalinism is Marxism with the heart cut out. Dehumanized, dried, frozen, petrified, rigid, and barren. And that is what we're fighting against, what we're fighting for, what genuine socialism is, is a profoundly human uh, living system in which everybody can participate, everyone can be involved. What, uh, what, what existed in the past was this dried, petrified caricature of socialism. It's very educational for us to study it so that we know how to uh, avoid it, what to fight against in the future. All right, thank you, Ben. We have Obaldo and then Pepe. In the history of Russian Revolution, Trotsky poses one of the central aspects of socialism. Particularly in what, in what refers to revolution. That is the direct intervention of the masses. Opposite to market that produces and reproduces in an anarchist manner, socialism needs a planification and a centralized direction to go forward. This cannot be achieved by a handful of people. You need the participation of the masses. That's why workers' democracy is fundamental. When we spoke about workers' democracy, we are not talking only about the Soviets, which I will refer in a second, but also the necessary conditions for the masses to intervene in politics. Working hours reduction to free women from uh, domestic uh, duties. All look forward to the masses to concentrate in the development of the productive forces in socialism. During the revolution, the motto force are the masses that pushes the revolution forward. In Russia, in the first moment, the active expression of the masses were the Soviets. 
a partir de los soviet de obreros y soldados fue como tomó el poder from the soviets of workers peasants and soldiers was how power was taken eh, a partir de ellos también y a partir de la cuestión del control eh, de revocación como la clase hacía manifestar from that and from the question on the revoke of the mandate was how the working class could express itself fue la clase obrera la que toma el poder no el no un aparato it was the It was the working class that took, took power. It wasn't the party or the apparatus. The 5th of January of 1918, the Soviets were invested with all the power to go govern. Esta estructura de poder obrero se creaba desde los barrios, las fábricas, los puertos, hasta de distritos. This power from the district, so, so, sorry, from the industry Soviets, from the uh, peasantry, were uh, then expanded to the district level. In a written by John Reed, there is a, there is a good description that reflects how the masses intervene in, uh, in, in power. The writing is called Soviets in Action. Eh, la actuar de los soviets era ejecutiva y legislativa, es decir, los obreros tomaban eh, las decisiones de qué hacer y también las tareas en sus manos para realizar. The um, soviets took the executive and legis legislative tasks, that means that they took part in the decisions and the, task, and the tasks and how to um, convey them. En las fábricas los soviets eran los que asumían la responsabilidad de las fábricas y en el campo eran los que repartían la tierra. In industries, the Soviets were who decided how to uh, take up the tasks and in the, um, in the countryside they decided how to deliver the land. Este comportamiento regular de los Soviets se había interrumpido por las condiciones en las que se desarrollaba la revolución. This regular behavior of the Soviets was interrupted by the conditions in which the revolution was taking place, Una guerra civil brutal. a brutal civil war, Una intervención imperialista. an imperialist intervention. No por nada Lenin la principal de la la política internacionalista revol that, That's why Lenin considered the principal defense to revolution the, internationally revolution, the international revolutionary politic. Gracias a la actividad política que realizaba el Estado soviético, eh, hacía que los otros se amotinaran en el mundo de la, de la enfermedad. Given the political activity that the Soviets did within the army, this made the, the other armies, the foreign armies, to recede when they come to the uh, battlefield. Se apostó por extender la revolución a un país más adelantado, como por ejemplo Alemania. They bet to spread the revolution to a more advanced country, for instance, Germany. La clase obrera eh, tuvo la posibilidad de tomar el poder en 1918, en 1918. The working class had the chance to take power in 1918 and then in 1923. Sin embargo, la socialdemocracia traicionó. However, social democracy betrayed. Lenin era muy claro, se necesitaba extender la revolución a Occidente. Lenin was very clear. It was needed to spread the revolution to to the West. Consideró cuestión de la de la consideró un aislamiento prolongado como una salida para and never consider a long uh, isolation as a way out from revolution. In a situation of a backward and isolated country uh, that is isolated from the world revolution, el papel del tomó una muy the role of state took a very, a very important um, um, function. Trotsky dice que el Estado, el Estado, era la garantía de sellar la alianza. Trotsky said that the function of the state was the warranty to seal the connection between the city and the countryside. La guerra civil y el bloqueo implicó la violencia personal que fue feroz. The civil war and the economic blockade intensified the, the struggle for personal subsistence that was ferocious. Económicamente hablando, no estaban las condiciones para desarrollar una red socialista. Economically speaking, there weren't the conditions to develop a socialist revolution in Russia. Pero políticamente no había otra. But politically, there wasn't any alternative. Trotsky dice que las condiciones nacionales sí estaban dadas. Trotsky said, says that the conditions at an international level, it, they were given. 
Por eso es que la tarea era una revolución internacional en la que Rusia solamente... That's why the task was an international revolution where Russia was, all, was only the beginning. Esto, ¿cómo se desarrollaron las cimientos? The way uh, events developed hindered the materialization of the international revolution. Bureaucracy didn't raise from a failure of a Bolshevism, but, but from a, a cruel civil war, from hunger, isolation, the killing of Kader, and fundamentally from the physical exhaustion of the working class that slowly began to recede from political activity. The working class faced a very complicated situation. Los datos son horribles. Durante la guerra murieron aproximadamente 9 millones de de hambre fría. The facts are terrible. During the civil war, approximately 9 million people died from hunger, uh, sickness, or the harsh winter. La parálisis del comercio eh, eh, afectó al campo y a la ciudad. Trade paralysis affected both the cities and the countryside. Cuando el hambre llegó a los centros urbanos. And when hunger arrived to the urban centers. There was an emigration from cities to the countryside. And for instance, in 1919, the number of working people uh, dropped uh, 76% uh, uh, in comparison to 1917. La En 1920 eran 2.200.000 personas, en 1920 apenas llegaban a 574.000 personas. In Petrograd, the whole population dropped from 2.400.000 in 1917 to 574,000 in 1920. The hunger and the lack of um, class consciousness from the working class Era tan desesperado, was so desperate incluso Lenin llegó a decir, that even Lenin said o los piojos derrotan al socialismo, o el socialismo derrotan a... or the louses uh, defeat socialism or socialism defeat the louses. Lenin decía que la clase obrera se había desclasado, había perdido su rutina de clase. Lenin said that the working class had lost its class routine. La inflación era incontrolable. Inflation was out of control. Y la miseria y la enfermedad se extendían rápidamente. And sickness and misery rapidly spreaded. Estas es en las que de la burocracia. These are the conditions how the race in bureaucracy was consolidating. Eh, algunos tratan de reducir el proceso de bureaucratización al enfrentamiento entre dos personas. Stalin. Some try to boil down the bureaucratization process to the confrontation between two personalities, eh, Stalin and Trotsky. Sin embargo, esta es una visión, una visión ascientífica. However, this is a non-scientific vision. El proceso de burocratización social. The bureaucratization process is a social uh, happening. Y no individual que tiene que ver con personalidad o carácter de un líder. And it's not an individual process that had to do with the car personal car characteristics of some or other leader. Niklas already spoken about the effects of the bureaucratization process. It did not only had effects in the Soviet state, but also in the Bolshevik party and in the international. All that, the, the structures that were formed to take power were deformed. Los enemigos de la burocracia aniquilados. The enemies of uh, bureaucracy were annihilated. Y el recuerdo de la borrado con la falsa. And the memory of the revolution was erased by the falsification of history. Thank you, Ubaldo. Then we have Pepe followed by Ion. My name is uh, Roberto Salti from the Italian uh, section of the RCI. Uh, in my contribution, I want to focus on a variant of the Stalinism, uh, which is uh, Maoism. 
uh, a trend that uh, is still playing a role in the workers' movement and is still affecting uh, a layer, tiny layer, but an important uh, layer of the youth that uh, are looking for the communist ideas. Well, we have to start uh, stating that for us, the Chinese revolution was the second major event in the history of humanity. So our criticism of Mao thinking is not an underestimation of uh, the workers and peasant revolution. The victory of the People's Liberation Army, this peasant army, was possible out of the collapse of Japan at the end of the Second World War. That was the imperialist power there in the region and the victory of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, in this, uh, on the aftermath of the Second World War, the U.S. imperialists cannot intervene anymore uh, in another war. And so the Chinese Communist Party in January 49, 1949 take, took power. But since the beginning, there were no Marxist uh, leadership. The Chinese Communist Party was already Stalinized, as the whole uh, of the other communist parties in the world. And this was showed by the fact that in the first period, uh, they tried to apply uh, Stalinist theory and they tried to develop capitalism, to, f to form a block with the other classes, uh, to strengthen national capitalism. It was a period of new, the new democracy. But uh, what happened? That the capitalists already fled, most of them uh, to Taiwan, and uh, any help from uh, the other capitalists in the world was uh, harmed by the Korean War. Well, the Chinese intervened, uh, supporting the Korean communists, and uh, the US, uh, they were forced to uh, put an embargo on uh, China. Uh, so capitalism was abolished in uh, China, but since the beginning, uh, uh, what we call... Uh, uh, the foreign worker state was born. Like uh, in the first period of the Stalin era, the 20s and the 30s, Mao and the bureaucracy, uh, after the overthrow of capitalism, tried to balance between the classes uh, to rule the country. And we saw a number of zigzags from left to right. Uh, in the 50s, for example, we got a big uh, zigzag uh, to the left, uh, uh, it was called the Great Leap Forward, then was reversed with a move to the right, and then we had uh, the most popular of the Mao's move, probably, uh, that uh, was called the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. A move uh, that was uh, taken by a number of uh, people from the left, and unfortunately by our uh, so-called friend uh, of the Fourth International, as uh, an unconscious uh, Trotskyist move by Mao. In 1960s, after the failure of the Great Leap Forward, there were real dangers of a return to capitalism uh, in uh, China. The sector of democracy around Mao were really against it and tried to mobilize a sector of society, specifically students, and a limited sector of uh, workers to strike against the capitalist elements. And most important, uh, as uh, in every in a classic Bonapartist uh, way, uh, Mao rely heavily on the army. Uh, so they start the struggle, and uh, the theoretical justification for the struggle against this capitalist element was wrong. It was following the line of Stalin uh, with the industrialization of the country in the 30s, at the end of the yeah, 30s. What Mao said, that in the transition from capitalism to socialism, class struggle must intensify. While, uh, as we all know, uh, we fight for socialism, for the abolition of the class society. <laughs> Seems that we are all here for this, no? Uh, <laughs> Engels says clearly that the state and socialism will wither away this was uh, his, uh, his uh, word. And it was a struggle led completely by the top. Uh, in, the, in the apologist of Mao, uh, there is a lot of saying about the fact that uh, there was freedom of criticism, that the students can criticize everything. 
but it was clearly stated you can criticize everyone and everything, but not Chairman Mao. Uh, and then uh, this struggle was made uh, not only with bureaucratic methods, with theoretical fail uh, flaws, but also on appeals on sacrifice and the idealism. With a bit like the stack on a uh, trend, no? In, uh, in, uh, in the USSR. And there was no independent role of the working class. One of the most well-known episodes of the Cultural Revolution, the Shanghai People's Commune, which took place in January 1967. This commune were, was open and closed in the space of 20 days. There were a very limited uh, uh, election of delegates to the bodies of these uh, communes. Of this commune. The communes were, were uh, headed, were led by the Red Guards, and uh, there was a body created by the Mao faction, full of students, the party and the army. There were little support of the work from, from the workers, because uh, the appeals were always on the increase of productivity, and why the workers have to increase productivity? For the love of Chairman Mao. Uh, so, uh, it's not, was not, uh, it was completely different from uh, the reason uh, formulated by the Bolsheviks to, for, for, uh, for the increase of production, for, uh, to get involved in the workers' democracy. On an international scenario, the Cultural Revolution uh, was, uh, yeah, went uh, all along with uh, a defense of Stalin against Khrushchev that was a revisionist. So it was a criticism of the 20th Congress of 1955, that was mentioned by, by Ben before. But uh, the, the line of the Chinese Communist Party was no better, was no more radical. We have always to remember that the biggest tragedy for the communist movement in the capitalist world after the Second World War was the slaughter of the Indonesian communists, the biggest communist party in the world, around three million members, they say, more than between one and a half and two million slaughtered by the, the army and by the reaction in Indonesia. Because the leadership of, 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 the, communist Indonesia, of the Indonesian Communist Party supported up until the end Sukarno, a nationalist bourgeois leader, on the advice of the Chinese Communist Party and of Mao itself. So, uh, and uh, Sukarno said, thank you, and then uh, the slaughter on, of the communists when the rise of the revolution movement tab began. So we have to, clearly to say to uh, this layer of youth that uh, is, try, is thinking to find an alternative in Maoism, that... Uh, it's no alternative. It's just a variant of uh, Stalinism. And we are well, about to finish. And uh, we must uh, arm our comrades with a thorough explanation. There were a number of articles made by Ted and Alan, and a very good book by, written by this one of our sympathizers, John Peter Roberts, I think, the name. Uh, that is available, but on, uh, well read, so... <laughs> Also, this is a very good uh, read after natural, natural Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, are our four pillars of the international, of the, this house that we are building. Thank you. Thank you, Pepe. Uh, we got another book recommendation. Now we have uh, Ion. I hope that's the name right way to pronounce it, and then uh, Josh. Ion for the Italian section. I want to go back to this self-sufficiency uh, that uh, Nicholas talked about. It's ABC for Marxists that uh, socialism is international or is nothing. Trotsky aveva spiegato che la ragione ultima della legislazione stalinista era stata... Trotsky said that uh, the ultimate reason for the uh, defeat of the revolution was the isolation of uh, USSR. E che 
la teoria del socialismo solo paese presto o tardi avrebbe portato a una deg- And the so- theory of the socialism in one country sooner or later would have led to a nationalist degeneration of the communist parties. Nell'Occidente questo è significato un accudamento dei partiti alle proprie In the West that mean that the, the, the communist leadership tail ended the nationalist the national bourgeoisie. Nei paesi dell'Est questo ha significato la formazione di burocrazie nazionali. E in Eastern, in the countries of the Eastern Bloc, this meant the birth of national bureaucracies. Nella maggior parte dei paesi queste esistevano perché erano state messe lì dall'armata. In most of these countries, the Red Army really shaped this bureaucracy. They existed only because the Red Army put them in power. In alcuni paesi, però, come la Jugoslavia e l'Albania, che erano paesi che si erano liberati da queste burocrazie, avevano una certa indipendenza. In other countries like Jugoslavia and Albania, where uh, the countries were liberated by the partisans, the bureaucracies uh, gained some independence, independence uh, from the Kremlin. Non è un caso che questi primi due paesi orientali che hanno rotto It's not an accident that these were the two, the first two Eastern countries uh, that uh, broke with the uh, Kremlin with Moscow. Successivamente, andato al potere in Romania, Ceausescu cerca di ritagliarsi una sua indipendenza. Later, Ceausescu, who was the, the dictator in uh, Romania, trying to get some independence from Moscow. E per esempio condannò l'invasione sovietica di Praga. And for example, he condemned the, the Russian invasion of Prague in 1968. Ovviamente non per amorazione operaia, ma per aiarsi. Not because he was very fond of workers' democracy, but to gain an independence. E non è molto saputo, ma Chu Enlai minacciò l'Unione Sovietica una vera e propria guerra nel caso l'Unione Sovietica avesse invaso la Russia. And it's not very well known, but Chu Enlai, then leader of the Chinese Communist Party, threatened Moscow of an invasion in the case that the USSR would have entered Romania. Successivamente abbiamo visto il conflitto sinodico Then we witness the Sino-Soviet uh, clash. Quindi quello che anche nel movimento operaio mentale è stato un vero e proprio shock dei conflitti tra stati sovietici. Uh, so, what uh, for the workers' movement in the West where was a real shock. Clashes and even wars between two so-called socialist countries. Tra Unione Sovietica e Cina ci fu il maglia Between China and the Soviet Union, there were uh, skirmishes on the border. Vietnam e Cambogia, e poi tra Cina e Vietnam ci sono state delle... But between Cambodia and Vietnam, and China and Vietnam, there were real wars happen. Yeah. happen. Questa politica delle varie razzie staliniste ha portato da una parte una ripresa della retorica... This uh, policy of the different uh, national uh, bureaucracies uh, led from one side to a uh, growth of the nationalist rhetoric. Qui, per esempio, in Romania c'era molto un'esaltazione della latinità, della lotta di Evo Romani. For example, in uh, Romania there was a really a big, big uh, publicity, a big, big boost about the late heritage of the Romanian, of the struggle of the Romanian people against uh, the Ottomans. Potete immaginare le sequenze di questa retorica nazionalista in dei paesi multinazionali calcani. And you can just imagine the consequences of this nationalist rhetoric in the countries like the one in the Balkans that are, that are formed with different nationalities in it. Sul piano economico questa politica ha fatto sì che il Comecon non fosse il socialismo mondiale in una scala un po' colata. This uh, rhetoric made that the Comecon, that was the economical organization that was formed out of the Eastern Bloc countries, 
Was not a cos'è che non era? Non era un Ok, sì, sì, it was not a world socialism. Ma un è un'organizzazione utile di um, economie non integrate. But a useless uh, body of uh, economies that were not integrated at all. E anzi, con questa politica diversi paesi, prima la Cina, la Jugoslavia e la Romea, cominciarono a cercare più con gli Stati Uniti. Man, with this uh, policy, a number of countries, uh, Jugoslavia, Romania, China, began to trade more with the US than with the so-called socialist countries. L'integrazione nel commercio capitalista portò anche un'integrazione miaista e quindi anche un indebitamento di paesi. The integration of this economy in the market led to an integration uh, also uh, a rise of the debt of all these countries. In particolare la Romania e la Jugoslavia avevano i debiti Jugoslavia and Romania, for example, they had huge debts, debts with the IMF. These debts in dollars should be repaid. So, what happened in the 80s in Yugoslavia and in Romania? They started austerity policy. Can you imagine a so-called socialist state that wage uh, austerity policy? In Yugoslavia si arrivò addirittura delle, alla formazione di grazie, diciamo, regionali. In Yugoslavia uh, there was the establishment of uh, real uh, regional bureaucracies. Per esempio, quando c'è stata la guerra di Jugoslavia negli anni 90, nei nostri articoli spiegavamo... For example, when uh, the, the, the war in Yugoslavia, the war in Yugoslavia in the 90s took place, in our articles we explained... ...che alla fine degli anni 80, la Repubblica Socialista di Slovenia e la Repubblica Socialista di Croazia, che facevano parte federale... The Slovenian Socialist Republic and the Croatian Socialist Republic were all part of the Yugoslavian Socialist Republic. They trade more with Germany. Oh, sorry, sorry. They trade more with, uh, with Germany than with the Serbian Socialist Republic. Questo ha portato al crollo di sistemi, purtroppo ha portato anche alla guerra in Italia. Uh, this led to a collapse of this uh, society, of this system, unfortunately to the, to the civil war in Yugoslavia as well. E quindi uno dei nostri compiti è anche quello di spiegare la differenza tra lo stalinismo e il comunismo. So one of our tasks is to explain the difference between stalinismo and communism at an international level. All right, then we'll have Josh followed by Friedrich. I completely agree with um, Ilva that this is an essential discussion to be having. And not just here, but throughout the entire communist movement. And the question of why the Soviet Union eventually collapsed is something that is being discussed and debated um, in other parts of the communist movement. At a theoretical conference of communist and workers' parties in 2017, a number of communist parties who defend the idea that the Soviet Union did establish socialism met to discuss this problem, including the Greek Communist Party and the Russian Worker Communist Party. But here we see the, the problem of Stalinism. In the statement that this meeting produced, the parties state that the USSR created a new world without exploitation and parasitism, a society of freedom and justice. But unfortunately, from the 1950s, the leadership of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union dragged this wonderful society to the right and destroyed it almost by accident. And if they just stuck with Stalin's policy um, in the 1940s, then we would all be living under socialism by now. Now, not only does this discredit communism itself in the eyes of the vast majority of the workers of the world, even worse, it distorts Marxism, perverts Marxism, which can only serve to confuse communists. 
which if it is allowed to succeed, actually rules out the success of the communist revolution. Now, to underline the point, what is communism? And by that, I mean both the lower stage socialism and the higher stage. I mean communism in general. According to the Communist Manifesto, it is the abolition of private property. And I've seen, I, I've seen no reason to abandon that definition. But is only a legal abolition sufficient? If all of the property in society is nationalized, the day after, does everybody live under communism? As Nicholas already explained, that is absurd. That it is a question of the development of the productive forces. Now, the Greek Communist Party, in a theoretical document about the collapse of the Soviet Union, explains that socialist production is directly social planned production. Uh, and I agree with that. But what if directly, socially, directly social planned production cannot, cannot produce enough? If you nationalize the land and leave peasants working with wooden plows, will you be able to produce enough to meet the needs of both the peasants and the cities? And this problem, in particular in the countryside, this problem was present throughout the entire history of the Soviet Union. Even as late as the 1980s, 25% of agricultural production in the Soviet Union was carried out on small individual peasant farms. Legally speaking, it wasn't their private property. So fantastic, they were living under communism. But here's the point. Private production persisted because it was actually the most effective way for those peasants to produce their means of subsistence. 80% of that agricultural product I referred to earlier was merely for the subsistence of the peasants themselves. To give one more statistic, in 1961, when according to Khrushchev, the Soviet Union was actually already beginning its transition to full communism, 66% of the potatoes produced in the Soviet Union were produced on small individual peasant farms. But who cares about potatoes? The top of the bureaucracy didn't care about potatoes. They could eat caviar and the finest sausages whenever they want. But I'm, I'm not Russian, and I didn't live in the 1960s, but I'm pretty sure that potatoes mattered to the Russian peasantry, as it was one of the most basic staples in the country. And Trotsky pointed out that this, this contradiction between the legal relations that were socialist in principle, in a formal sense, and the low level of the productive forces, which in parts of the countryside was lower than the level of capitalism, let alone socialism, it would either be resolved by the socialist relations being fulfilled, if you like, by the development of the economy, or that those relations themselves would be dragged down into capitalist restoration. And what we see, actually, even from the 1930s when Stalin was in charge, is more and more concessions to private production and even commodity production in the countryside. 90% of the farms were collectivized in the Soviet Union, but the collectives, each collective was given the land for its eternal use. Um, collectives that had better machinery or just better, more fertile land actually started um, um, renting out land to other peasants. You had the phenomenon of millionaire collectives in the 30s. And even the peasants who were living in the collectives actually had their own private tiny plots of land, but which was legally classed as being part of the collective. But from the 50s onwards, more concessions are made. The level of requisitions of agricultural products by the state is reduced to give more of a surplus to the peasants. The taxation of privately owned land, um, livestock is abolished. And even in industry, which was entirely state owned and planned, and, and which was relatively highly developed, at least in heavy industry, the directors of the state trusts, who obviously were not subject to democratic workers' control, were incentivized to increase the productivity of labor by being given cash bonuses, not for exceeding production con uh, targets in the plan, which was the previous case, but for exceeding sales targets. Sales targets which were still linked to the general economic plan, but were obviously a concession to the market that was actually growing stronger, not weaker. And then these directors would take their cash bonus, bonus and spend it in a very healthy black market that was present in the cities as well as the countryside. In the 1970s, there was talk of, it was called para-economy, parallel economy. 
and something called shadow capital, money that was being saved up and embezzled, often within the collectives, which the heads of the collectives, who were part of the bureaucracy, wanted to spend in order to make more money. But they were prevented from doing so by the fact that the Soviet Union, for all its faults, was a nationalized planned economy. But that provided a very powerful incentive to make the collectives and make the state-owned industries private so they could turn themselves into real capitalists, which they eventually did. Now, some of the measures, some of those concessions that I talked about might um, sound familiar or similar to some of the concessions that the Bolsheviks were forced to make in the early 1920s. Lenin, um, uh, well, the Bolsheviks abolished just direct state requisition of, of grain and introduced a tax in kind. At that time, Lenin said explicitly, we are too poor and isolated, we have to make concessions to the market. He said openly to the workers, we, we are socialist in that we are striving to move towards socialism, but we have not built socialism. And actually, this is a retreat from socialism, which contains the inherent possibility or prob uh, probability of capitalist restoration. And that ultimately, only the re world revolution would be able to save socialist construction in the Soviet Union. But when the Communist Party makes even further, in some respects, co concessions to private production in the 1960s, this is presented not as a step back, but as a step forward to full communism. And the theoretical idea that you would always have a market under socialism was propagated. Why would they do that? This tells us everything about the mentality and theoretical approach of Stalinism. Let's quickly look at the timing of some of these declarations. Stalin didn't announce that the Soviet Union had succeeded in building socialism when he took power in 1924. If I'm not mistaken, it might have been earlier. Um, the achievement of socialism was announced in 1935. So up until this point, we've had forced collectivization and famine, the victory of fascism in Germany, and the liquidation of the strongest communist party in Europe, and the beginnings of the turn internationally to the popular front, where communists who'd just been shot for trying to launch premature revolutions were being told they now have to work with the bourgeois. The word socialism basically became a red rag that the bureaucrat bureaucracy could drape around itself in order to secure its position. To say, don't worry, we've done it, we've achieved socialism. And that declaration was immediately followed by a turn to the right. What about Khrushchev in 1960? First, he has announced that the, um, the Communist Party that he was a part of and the Politburo that he was a part of murdered masses of innocent people in the purges. And he has openly acknowledged that now, but of course it's all Stalin's fault. His party and his bureaucracy has just crushed the Hungarian Revolution, which Ben talked about. And internationally, the Yugoslavian state, which is not under the control of the Soviet bureaucracy, is presenting itself as an alternate, alternative model, as was China. And this was the beginning of the Sino-Soviet split. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was preaching peaceful coexistence with US imperialism. And, and all of a sudden, Khrushchev comes out and says, I've got good news. The Soviet Union has so completely and irreversibly established socialism, we are now beginning the transition, transition to the highest stage of co communism. It's saying to the Russian working class, don't worry, we've got this under control. And it's saying to the world working class that the Soviet Union is the leader of all the Soviet nations, that abomination of a term. So do what we tell you to do, not what the Yugoslavs or the Chinese tell you to do. And through this, we see a perversion of the word socialism. So it becomes nothing but the concealed interests of the Soviet bureaucracy and the complete destruction of anything even approaching Marxist theory. In this revolutionary epoch, we must bury these false theories if we are going to succeed in the immense class battles ahead. I'll finish. Thank you, Josh. Now there's Fredrik, and if we have time, Kaspar. I'm uh, Fredrik from the Swedish section. One of the most uh, common arguments against communism, at least in Sweden, is that it supposed supposedly killed 100 million people. 
The one source for this claim is a book called The Black Book of Communism by Stéphane Courtois. The whole book is a massive fraud. It's even criticized by the co-writers of the book because they say she was obsessed, or he, I don't know if it's he or she, was obsessed by uh, to create this number, 100 million. And you could ask, for example, who is responsible for those who died when 21 foreign armies invaded the Soviet Union? Is it the workers and peasants who had assumed power and were fighting for the liberation of mankind? Or is it the generals, the capitalists and the imperialists who are trying to drown the revolution in blood? For Courtois, as for all the bourgeois, it's the workers and peasants and communists, of course, who are, who are at fault. And of course, their problem is not that people die. As you know, they're perfectly happy to let the Israeli ruling class massacre the Palestinians, as they were happy to let the Saudis massacre the people of Yemen, as they were happy to let Erdogan slaughter the Kurds. Their problem is that the slaves assumed power. And when they tried to crush the slaves, the slaves fought back and won. And just like Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky are like a torch of hope for like an entire new generation of communists. They are a symbol of everything that the ruling class hates. I think in many countries, like if you say anything at all that the ruling class doesn't like, they will call it communism. So you cancel student debt, that's communism. The workers go on strike, communism. You want to stop the capitalists from looting the schools, the elderly care, the hospitals, etc. That's communism. And of course, many young people start to think, maybe this communism, it doesn't sound so bad. I think one of the best people in the world at throwing these accusations of communism at everyone and everything is Donald Trump. And I think he's doing us a big favor. Like each time he mentions it, you see the searches for communism just skyrocket. But then, of course, the bourgeois, they have to scare people. Like uh, many comrades have said, they, they want to tell people, don't try it. So they come back to this accusation of the 100 million. Um, and the reason they can make people believe this, I think, is the crimes of Stalinism, which I think have been exposed very thoroughly here. And it is true that millions of people died needlessly due to their policies. But that's not communism. We don't defend them, uh, those policies. We fight for real communism. And then you ask, of course, how many die needlessly under capitalism each year? 333 million people suffered out of acute food insecurity in uh, 2023. 800 million suffered of uh, chronic hunger. Meanwhile, the five richest persons in the world owned or controlled 869 million um, billion dollars. So you think, how many people die of starvation, of poverty each year, just so that this handful of people can continue get, to get even richer? And how many people die each year of like illnesses that should be very easy to cure actually with modern technology? Or how many die of other conditions that would be easy to solve if you just take like a few percent of those over 2,000 billion dollars that they are putting to war, starvation and death each year, the imperialist powers. I think if you want to count, have a competition of early deaths, you would have capitalism, imperialism and colonialism. They would, like, they would pr provide a whole library of these black books. And what is the only thing to save us from this barbarism? Well, that's the communist revolution. Thanks. Thank you, Fredrik. Now it's Kaspar who will be the last speaker. And my name is Kaspar. I'm from the Swiss section. And I wanted to give a small afterword to what Nicholas explained, because I think the period of the, the implosion of Stalinism in Russia has a lot of consequences for the world we see today. Because the Swiss ruling class, they had 200 years or 150 years to perfect their bourgeois state. But in Russia, this was done in a period of 10 years that were really, really turbulent. And this period of the 90s produced extreme um, pol social polarization in Russia between the workers and the poor. You know, 2, 000, over 2,400 companies were just closed down in a period of less than five years. And, uh, and the oligarchs in the year 2000, 
one percent, the wealthiest one percent um, owned fifty four percent of all assets in Russia, and they treated the state as a as a prostitute, buying votes and influence. And by nineteen ninety eight. Yeltsin did not only have a really low approval rate of 3%, but they had also bankrupted the state. And there was a general situation of insecurity. Even the, this new capitalist, they didn't respect private property from each other. And they used violence to resolve conflicts, armed violence. And Yeltsin had unleashed uh, not only Russian, Russian uh, chauvinism, but also... Um, the, the, the national question with the republics. And there were a series of uh, armed conflicts in the republics that also spread to mainland Russia and to Moscow with terrorists attack, even if some of them looked really fishy. But for example, the, for example, the second uh, ethnic cleansing of last year in Bergkarabakh is a late, uh, late consequence of what happened then. But this situation produced the rise of Putin, and he was a lifelong um, secret agent. This was probably one reason why Yeltsin um, was looking at him as a successor, because he, he could say, uh, guarantee that he would survive because of the connections to the Secret Service. And he was made uh, prime, minister, prime Minister in 1999. But I'm not sure if he was really intelligent, but he was certainly cunning and really brutal. Because his first, uh, the first uh, way, the first step to stabilization was uh, b brutal wars, and he used uh, the military and the security services really um, ruthlessly, especially in these wars in Chechnya. And then he also reestablished uh, so, uh, uh, some economic stability or coherence through the state. But he didn't go back to any f uh, form of planned economy. But he renationalized uh, big parts of the oil and gas industry, or yeah, or state control over, and introduced elements of uh, economic nationalism and protectionism to reduce capital flight. And he expropriated some of the oligarchs and gave their assets to his friends. And with that, he built he built, uh, he built uh, or he organized a capitalist class that was uh, loyal to him, because they still depend 100 percent on him for the respect of their private property. And I think this is the main element of this uh, Bonapartism that he, he represents, that he balances between this yeah, dependent capitalist and the, and the working class, because his social support depends. Um, on one side, on the oil rent, which is very important, and also on the in the first uh, period on an economic boom after the year 2000, which he was not responsible of, but very lucky. And since then, I think you see that that his his uh, popularity and social st stability really flows the price of oil. But he could uh, reduce the impact of the 2008 crisis on the working class through subsidies. But he couldn't buy this stability forever, so in the period 2011-2012, we saw big movements against him, which led him to do what he knows best after the Chechnya wars and what every Bonapartist loves best, uh, is military adventures, which helps him also to wipe up nationalism and support in Russia. With the war 2012 in Syria, after 2014 in Ukraine, which always uh, wipe up his, his uh, support in the polls. But that this is not a, a stable situation, we saw also in 2018, when there were again huge protests or big protests around the pension reform, um, where he had to apply austerity and then it is immediately backfired. But now again, as the comrades uh, explained, everything depends on, on how the war in Russia developed. But this is really not, not a stable situation, even if it looks stable and he has social support. But as, as, the, yeah, as, the, as ca capitalism was restored in Russia in the period of general decline of the system, and because this, I mean, the Swiss bourgeoisie is not, best, not, a, not a role model, but I think the Russian capitalists they are even more degenerate. And they were never able to develop anything like a stable capitalism. And so this remains a really, really unstable situation in the, in the whole Russia and the former republics. 
And as we saw in, our, in, our, in this conflict between Armenia, um, you, you see that armed conflicts and the national question can also come, then, then didn't solve anything, it can come back at any moment. And that under capitalism, there can be no the, the, the stable democracy in Russia. Thank you to all comrades that intervened. I think it's been a very wide ranging discussion. Before I leave it to Niklas to sum up, I will read out two questions. Now, the first one is that how you address the argument that those who have lived under so-called communist countries, they don't want communism. It's only people who live in Western countries. And that's because they haven't experienced it. And the, the second one is a uh, um, proposal or request for, by, uh, to Niklas. If he can expand on, on the mass move, movements that we saw in the, in the Stalinist countries. So now I will hand it over to Niklas to uh, expand and answer. I've got a fan in the audience there. Um, yeah, I think this discussion is very important on a number of, for a number of reasons. One is the fact that we're faced with this question, you know, constantly, oh yes, but what about the Soviet Union? What about, you know, communism in Eastern Europe and so on? And we need to be able to answer that question. And as uh, I think it was, uh, was it, uh, was Josh? Uh, the answers that are provided by a lot of the Stalinist organizations are completely nonsensical. They make no sense to people. And it's because they aren't based in Marxist theory. They're not based with a Marxist method. You can see that in some ways they're starting to approach like Trotsky's position on a sort of superficial level. They criticize the bureaucracy. They criticize the right-wing turn. But because they don't actually understand what's behind this, it, it all becomes rather shallow. And that's one simple reason why they can't actually take their deep in their analysis and understanding. And that's because if they use the Marxist method to try to deepen the understanding of what happened in the Soviet Union, they would inevitably wound up in have taking the same position that Trotsky did. Because it's the Marxist, Marxist method that led Trotsky to the conclusions that he drew. Basing himself on Mar what Marx had written about uh, socialism, and uh, what Lenin had written about it, and then obviously his own analysis of what was taking place. And to that, you can add Ted Grant then, who applied Trotsky's method, or Marx's method, to what took place after Trotsky had died. Mm -hmm. uh, I will return to that a little bit later. Uh, I wanted to come start with a couple of the questions. The one about, uh, actually, Fred, uh, you know, if you saw it, there was a debate between Fred and uh, a debate, uh, sort of discussion between Fred and a uh, uh, Romanian pianist on, on GB News the other week. And one of the questions that was raised was precisely this. Yeah, but you, you Fred, you haven't lived in the Soviet Union, in uh, Eastern Europe, you don't know what it's like. And the pianist was saying this, it was like, oh yeah, I was there, I know what it's like. But the, but the pianist was the same age as I was. <laughs> it's like the regime in R Romania collapsed when he was like five or six years old. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember much before I was five and six years old. And if you, actually, if you look at the people who do remember something of the previous regime, or what it was like, their attitude is completely different. <laughs> Because all that these younger generations have to rely on is, uh, you know, the constant proper barrage of propaganda they've been faced with over the last decades. I think all that is changing now, but that's that's the reason for the difference between the youth and the and the older generations, precisely because the older generation knows something about the truth of what was there. In uh, in Ukraine, for example. Before, uh, in 2019, so before the latest war, in the overall population, 38% uh, thought that the restoration of capitalism was a mistake versus 47% uh, to thought it was correct. Well, if you want to be really specific, the question is like about market economy or something like that, which makes it harder to really understand the question from the person who's answering. 
because, because they mixed up the terms, right? Market economy means capitalism, but in a lot of these countries, this is not clear because of the way the Stalinists have mixed up the terminology. But among those who were over 60, the majority regretted the return to uh, the restoration of capitalism. In Russia, actually, to this day, 51% against 38%, 51% regret the restoration of capitalism. And in 2009, after the worst of the counter-reforms of the Schröder government, 57% of the population of East Germany was uh, defending the GDR. So this, uh, this uh, picture that they want to paint of like, uh, oh, now everyone in Eastern Europe are all in favor of uh, capitalism, it's not true. There are differences between different countries, but because some countries, restoration of capitalism wasn't an unmitigated disaster. Poland, Czech Republic. There are other countries where it was an absolute disaster. And Ukraine is actually the country, one of the countries which have been worst affected by the restoration of capitalism. <laughs> the economy has never recovered from the level, to back to the level it was in 1989. <laughs> and now after three years of war, which are completely linked to the restoration of capitalism, the situation is going to be even worse. Now a comment asked about the mass movements in, uh, against Stalinism in uh, the Eastern Europe and in Russia. Well, uh, Ben already explained uh, about the hung Hungary in 1956, which was a classic example of what we call the political revolution, where the workers actually uh, rise up and attempt to take over the power that has been taken away from them and subject the state to the control of the working class. And it is a very interesting example of precisely of how that took place. In, uh, uh, during the period of the collapse of the Soviet Union, so in the late 80s, early 90s, there were elements of that taking place in, um, also. Uh, and most of the people, so if you, if you look at uh, East Germany, for example, there were mass movements out on the street protesting. The main slogan was, we are sind das Volk, i.e. we are the people. That is, there was a democratic slogan. They said, we want to have the power. We are the people. You're supposed to represent us. We want you to represent us, not impose things on us. <laughs> we can't put a litmus test and say, you know, measure the exact uh, nature of what people were thinking at that time. <laughs> But if you look at the slogans, what they, what they were saying and so on, you get some ideas. And, and clearly they were thinking, right, we can have, uh, yes, we like some bits about what the society we live in now, you know, we have some benefits from it. But there are all these problems and we want to solve them, right? So, and the way to do that is with democracy, how, whatever that is. It was some kind of idea, like I think they were thinking of like, well, democratic socialism, something like that, this vague idea that they have in their head. Um, but they weren't thinking, oh yeah, yeah, what we want is restoration of capitalism. But there was a difference between 1989 and 1956. The degeneration of the uh, East and the uh, Bloc and the Soviet Union had gone much further. <laughs> and, which is very important, the, the, the state of the class struggle in the rest of the world. The restoration of capitalism in uh, in the East was only made possible by the defeats of the working class in the West. As you know, the, the 80s was the beginning of a return to the right in uh, all of Europe and the United States. Reagan, Thatcher and so on. And this obviously meant that the working class, they, they were on the retreat, they were being defeated, as they could not provide an alternative to the workers of the East. And Trotsky always conceived of the future of the so of, uh, socialism in, in the Soviet Union and the world as being settled on an international scale. <laughs> Not in the stupid caricatured way that the Stalinists like to present it. That we're going to have revolution all over the world at the same time, same moment, you know? I mean, this is a ridiculous caricature and has no relation to what Trotsky actually writes. It's just, they just invented it. Um, but his idea was always, in order to achieve what we're trying to achieve, we need to spread the revolution. And the victory of the working class in the West would resolve the problems that we're facing in the East. 
precisely the low level of productive forces, the backwardness of culture and so on. I'm not here trying to compare like, oh yes, the better music in one country or another. But, but the level of literacy and level of education, at least before the Second World War, was a lot higher in the West. Um, and f throughout uh, the period, the level of the productive forces, level of capital, level of investment, the technology was much higher in the West. Um, Josh, in, uh, on Friday, will speak on the question of socialism in one country, which is precisely the opposite of this perspective of Trotsky. And it also relates to something that Obaldo said. He made an important point that although the conditions of socialist, for socialism did not exist in Russia in 1917, they did exist on a world scale. And that's precisely the, need, the reason for the need to spread the revolution to the other countries. But also, as I think several comrades touched on, the, the point of a socialist revolution is not to win, take power in one country and then trying to put the, for, the uh, force, the productive forces uh, back into the framework of the national market. <laughs> the basis of communism can only be achieved on a world scale. Uh, unless you want to have communism without mobile phones, without cars, without computers, we're going to need to have to deal or trade with other countries where the components necessary are, can be produced. <laughs> to attempt to force the productive forces back into the national market is an attempt to basically roll back uh, the economy back to the way it was before the 19th century. <laughs> And actually, even, in the, even if there's national bureaucracies in the East attempted to do that, obviously, in reality, they couldn't. Uh, Roberto also mentioned another important uh, thing, question. He talked about the, the deformed worker state. I also used this expression, uh, but I didn't explain it very much. But what, what we mean when we say deformed worker state? It is uh, a state where the productive relations are, so to speak, socialist, they're nationalized, they're uh, common. Capitalism has been abolished. But politically, the working class has been expropriated. There is a state, basically, but it's out of the control of the working class. Even though it's supposed to be a worker state, it's actually not. And that, it also relates then to the question of the state. What in reality is the state and what's the purpose of the state? Now, I, I was looking into this and I was looking into the concept of really existing socialism. And uh, I, I was trying to find someone who's tried to, you know, someone who, a Stalinist basically, who would explain what this means. And I really couldn't find anyone. I'm sure someone tried, but they couldn't find any decent explanations. But I stumbled across a demoralized uh, Swedish Stalinist who is presently living in Finland, who was talking about, you know, really existing socialism. And he said something along the lines of, um, well, um, you know, communism, it's like a classless society, a society of superabundance, where the state had withered away. But that's a practical impossibility. And he says, the reason for this is, as soon as two people meet, one person will always have power over the other. I mean, what kind of bullshit is this? It's basically, if I go and take any of you, I'll go over you, like, we'll sit down and have a coffee. Immediately, we will lay, lay the basis of a power relationship where one, I or you, will dominate over the other. But it's not too far away from like the anarchist conception of a state, which is basically, I mean, there's lots of ideas, but let's just say, that basically, it's an idea. Someone gets an idea into their head that we're going to have a state. And, and then people accept it for whatever reason, unbeknownst to anyone. But I'm saying this because actually, despite going down this road, not only are the Stalinists uh, dirtying the day of communism and failing to analyze the, the Soviet Union, 
but they're completely abandoning all Marxist analysis of the state. Because if you don't, can't, <laughs> if you don't understand, this, if, you don't, if you go down this road of basically trying to misunderstand completely the nature of the state, uh, in the case of the Soviet Union, then you will get the same misunderstanding in the case of capitalism. And if you look, for example, of the policy of the Popular Front and so on, all of this, you can see that clearly that there's no conception, Marxist conception of the state have been thrown out the window. What is then the state? The, the state is uh, an uh, armed bodies of men, Engels called it, in defense of particular property relations. And it's also an attempt to manage the class struggle. It's, it's there to stop the class struggle from, uh, from breaking up and, and consuming society itself. And this is the role also that the state played in the Soviet Union. As we, basically defending the privileges of the bureaucracy as well as defending the property relations of the Soviet Union. We also refer to it sometimes uh, by another term, which is proletarian bonapartism, which is basically this, that when the class struggle reaches a certain intensity, the state can rise above society to the point where it's no longer under the direct control of a class in which it's supposed to base itself on. In other words, the state was supposed to base itself on the workers. It was supposed to be a worker state. But it raises itself above society, balancing on the contradiction between the imperialist powers and the working class in in Soviet Union. And on this and on this basis, gets an in an independence from the uh, the class itself. And that's also one of the reasons why the bureaucracy was so afraid of the world revolution, because every step forward for the world revolution was a step back for the bureaucracy. The confidence that would uh, that would uh, that the victory of the world of the uh, the confidence that the victory of the working class in one of the advanced capitalist countries that confidence would completely would have given a massive boost to the confidence of the workers inside the Soviet Union and would have led to lo uh, many more hungry 1956, which by the way was not easy for the bureaucracy to suppress. They had to bring troops all the way from eastern Russia to make sure that none of them spoke any common language with the people, the, the revolutionaries in Hungary. And they had to tell the troops it was a fascist insurrection. I won't touch on the Black Book of Communism. <laughs> it's a joke, in bad taste. Thankfully, this seems to have largely forgotten out of being forgotten by now. Um, but yeah, it's 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 make believe basically. The comrades also spoke. I can't remember who it was. So about to spoke about China, and there I think as as Roberto said, the role of Bonapartism. You can see it very clearly. Mao had uh, we say he had a tendency to be under ultra left. That was his natural instinct, as you can say, with the Great Leap Forward and then with the Cultural Revolution. But above all, he had one principle, which was himself. And the truth is, look, you look at what happened after the Cultural Revolution, which was meant to be against the capitalist roaders. What does he do? He puts, what, he puts them back in charge. As soon as he, he was restored, he puts the capitalist roaders back in the government. And it's not like he didn't know what they stood for. He knew perfectly well what they stood for. Mao is responsible for Dengism. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, but he, I think the point they were about to make as well, they, he made sure that the, the Cultural Revolution did not penetrate into the working class. Actually, towards the end, it was starting to reach into the factories. They're starting to mobilize. It was felt, well, look, actually, maybe we should participate in this. And the students on their own initiative started to go into the factories and talking to the workers. And then Mao shut it down. Sending the army, sm smashed any kind of attempts to independent action. And that was the end. Because there's one thing he could not accept and that was the involvement of the workers in this movement. But um, anyway, this is a very, uh, as I said, this is a very important question.
which touches upon many elements of Marxist theory. And it's very important that the comrades take it seriously and that they study these questions. Because they will not just learn about the Soviet Union, but they will understand something about the method of how to analyze society and, and how to, in a concrete way, evaluate the balance of forces between different classes and between different segments of society, try to uncover and read what's going on underneath in society, not just what's going on on the surface. And even... Even if there's no real perspective then of a Stalin restoration of a new Stalinist regime, it's not really on the cards. But whatever the future holds, this will help us understand uh, how to intervene. And how we are to relate to these movements that are inevitably going to take place. So comrades, read and study. And pray, pray yourself, arm yourself with Marxist ideas, with theory. That's what you're going to need in the common world proletarian revolution. Thank you.